Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we're talking about the saga of Julian Assange with Richard Hillgrove, who ha- who was hired by Assange in 2018 to lobby British MPs for his release and worked for him until September 2020. You can find Richard Hillgrove at six, that's numeral six, hillgrovepr.com. Richard, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. Love it to be here. Thanks for coming on. So how did you get to to meet and get hired by Julian Assange? Wow, that was quite some time ago. I think back in um, 2016, I first went to see him inside the Ecuadorian embassy. He was there for a very long time. I've been doing a lot of work with um, Vivian Westwood and her family. And she's obviously very good friends with uh, Julian Assange. But interesting, so I actually went in there in that capacity um, with one of her children to see him. Um, but it wasn't for some time later that I actually got hired by Julian Assange. It was at the time, um, and it was via his lawyers. If you recall, um, the Ecuadorians decided to cut off all of his internet access and telephone access, and he was completely shut off from the outside world. And at that point, you know, he likes to sort of be the master and commander and and call all the shots and very much, very much to his own PR. But, up, you know, at that point, he was immobilised. He couldn't do anything. So I got hired to be his eyes and ears, if you like. Um, technically, it was with the brief of lobbying the British MPs to support him. He had not much support at the time, um, but it was much more wider reaching than that. So it was like a personal publicist role. So, so not just privately to MPs, but through the media as well. Correct. Yeah, through the media, um, being his representation. Um, but obviously, um, the only people that could speak for him largely were the lawyers. So, you know, handling interviews and, and all that sort of stuff as well. I've been the press secretary for a presidential candidate who did his own <laughs> thing very much. And that's not easy to speak for someone else who's good at speaking. Uh, how, do you, how do you do that? No, exactly. Well, if, if they can't argue back, um, it, it created an unusual window of opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a rare moment of opportunity. And obviously what's happened to him now is an absolute travesty. Um, this ongoing saga, uh, which is now playing itself out in the courts, is just quite a, quite a sad situation as far as I can see. Uh, absolutely. I want to get to what, uh, where we are at the moment, um, but how did it go lobbying MPs? Was, was there any support? I think he's, you know, he's been tarred and feathered with all of the accusations and a lot of his supporters, you know, that were once, you know, he was, it was very much champagne socialism at one point where everyone from, you know, um, Jemima Goldsmith to, Interestingly, Sting and Trudy Styler even supported him at one point. I don't know if anyone actually has ever heard that, but they were big supporters. People put up that bail money and obviously lost it. And, you know, the people then sort of suddenly left the building and no one wanted to even talk about Julian Assange. You know, in the UK, the United Nations had been saying for several times that he needed to be released. Um, the UK was taking a very different stance to it, and most of the MPs was sort of going along those lines. Um, very, very small numbers of MPs that were, you know, dis- dissenting voices. Obviously, from the Labour Party point of view, um, all all too little, too late. You know, once they left the Ecuadorian embassy, there was noises from the Labour Party, the former leader, Jeremy Corbyn. But, you know, when he was actually the leader, he wasn't saying a lot, if you see what I mean. So um, pretty much silent, silent on all fronts. Pockets of pockets of support, but nothing, nothing to you know, write home about, basically. <laughs> and and you attribute this to the general public in the UK swallowing the government line about Assange, or uh, that's more or less what I would describe as the the US situation. Well, you know, I suppose, I think in many ways Assange has been his own worst enemy. Um, he's very non-partisan, and he's burned a lot of bridges with with people and he hasn't always played the PR game so well. And I think people just, you know, they got reminded constantly that they were paying for the bill for all the police officers to be outside and kind of got annoyed with it all. Um, So 
they sort of fell out of love with Julian Assange in many ways. I think, I think in recent times, I think people in the UK, like everywhere else in the world, have started to see that he is, you know, as a symbol of our freedom of expression and and the right to be able to publish um, what's happening to him is unfair. But they kind of don't know what to do about it. You know, he's been made an example of now. He's become sort of the most famous example of, you know, if you want to leak or if you want to publish, uh, be damned. And, and people don't know what to do about it. So even if they do support him, they're remaining rather quiet about it. And there's obviously lots of global voices that that are supporting him. The UK seems to be a bit quiet on many fronts. And, and how do you explain, you would think his interests are the media's interests? How do you explain, I mean, when you have done interviews on his behalf with the media, it's sort of you up against the media, right? I mean, they're they're against him despite his interests seeming to be those of free media? Well, I think what you're saying was the case, but it seems to have shifted. Um, and I'd organised, I organised in an event at the Frontline Club before I departed working for him and his biological father, John Shipton, came along and he said, we've seen a marked shift from the media, you know, universally condemning this person who doesn't seem to know where to stop. And, and whose side he's on, to now it being about all of our right to express an opinion. And I think you know, the perfect example would be the Guardian newspaper in the United Kingdom. And they were condemning Assange for, for months and months and months and just, you know, really having a go at him. And now, if you look at their stance, they say he, sh he should not be extradited uh, in any way, shape or form. And these are people who are not fans of Julian Assange whatsoever. However, they, they see the wider view that he still has the right to publish, even though we don't like what he has to publish. We don't like the way he operates. But, you know, the point is, if he goes down, we all go down. I mean, who's going to feel brave enough to leak a story now when they could get extracted from their home environment and removed to another country for, to stand trial? It's a nightmare. It's an excellent question. Uh, we're speaking with Richard Hillgrove, who worked for Julian Assange. You can find him at 6hillgrovepr.com. Richard, I haven't noticed that shift in U.S. media. Have I missed it? Is it there? <laughs> I think there's a bit of a malaise, really, on it. I think that he just there's all he's almost become more than a man now. He's become almost a myth, and I think the narrative seems to have sort of exhausted itself a bit, and it's sort of snaking its way towards this this appeal now to decide whether the, the, the legal process can be reversed and he can stay after all in the United Kingdom. And people, I think, have just sort of seen it all and now are a bit exhausted with the narrative. So I think people are distrustful too with what they've been told. They're not sure whether they've been told everything. Is it is this real? Is he really going to go? Or do, or do the people who are pulling the strings already know the answer to how this is going to conclude? People have just come a bit switched off to the whole thing. Can you, just for people who've been living under a rock for decades, uh, can you <laughs> can you give us a, a brief? Uh, what did he do? Why did he end up living in an embassy? And what is the legal situation now? Well, it's, it's a mixture of things, but basically he, he published a whole lot of war secrets, if you like, um, and the American government sort of said, well, you know, you put people's lives in danger for publishing all that. Julian Assange has always said that he redacted all of the sensitive detail. The American government will say, well, no, you didn't. You made people unsafe, and therefore we're going to take you out of where you live, and we're going to try you criminally. And, you know, he's always argued that that's trying to say that he was party to, to the theft of information um, with all this data, and he's always argued that he received the data in good faith, as a journalist would, and just published it and had the right to publish it. And that's like a hall of mirrors because it's a he said, she said. They have got no evidence to suggest that he was party to it. They're implying that he was. They want a jury trial. It all becomes, you know, cooked up, and it's um, it's quite a dangerous situation in many ways because it's sort of showing the power of the American government. It's acting as a sort of fear tool. Um, you know, you upset us and say something we don't like and we can extract you from where you live. You know, the fact that anyone can it sort of set a precedent internationally now and this same sort of behaviour where the government will sort of burst in and, and sort of 
make journalists feel like criminals um, is starting to happen in pockets all around the world now. And I think Julian Assange is this sort of living example of, you know, watch yourself. And so why was he living in an embassy and then a prison? And, and now what's the, the situation? Well, obviously, he was living in the embassy because he was protected um, by being in the embassy. And there was all this issue with the, um, the Swedish case, which many people think was cooked up and invented as a tool in order to get him extradited anyway. But while he was inside the Ecuadorian embassy or any embassy that would have received him, it could have been a... And it could have been the Australian embassy or it could have been anywhere, but it happened to be the Ecuadorian embassy and they gave him political asylum. He was safe while he was in there from, from anything happening. And then obviously, very unusually, uh, you know, and I think Ecuador will, you know, it will come back and bite them eventually. They breached that trust, that political asylum, and come out with a whole lot of cock and bull about how he was smearing feces on the wall, which just never happened. Um, and he was a really bad housemate. All this nonsense was coming out in the media, so they turfed him out on the street. And now, obviously, at that point, all he'd done was breach his parole bail conditions and had to serve time for that. But obviously, now they've got him, they don't want to let him go. And this whole case with the extradition is now kicked in. So the first first round of that was, no, he's not going to be extradited. Um, you know, so then he should have been allowed to walk free. But, you know, they thought, well, if we did let him go free because he's not being extradited, it'd be hard to get him to return to court. He's got form. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they didn't let him go. They kept him in solitary confinement in Belmarsh, which is an extraordinary, extraordinary act, you know. He's just one of yes. those people that, that has a certain psychology. He likes to leak. Um, he does seem to be indiscriminate about it. Um, he's quite non-partisan. Um, so he doesn't seem to fall on anyone's side. So it's very hard for people to say, well, at least he's one of us. Right. He'll, he'll do it to any party that he feels like, you know, there's information he wants to get into the public domain. That's his psychology. And I think people just don't know what to do with them. You know, and but, technically... But, so. Sorry, for, for years, Richard Hill, Hillgrove, the evidence that he was some sort of lunatic was precisely that he was predicting that the United States would try to extradite him, that the United States was behind all of this, uh, which seems to have proven true. Uh, and nobody's gone back and said, you know, maybe he was right all along. Well, yeah, like he was like a Nostradamus figure, but um, <laughs> it wouldn't take much to predict that he might be uh, wanted in America if they weren't actually that happy. I suppose it, the problem for America is it's, if it didn't stop there, where would it stop? And, and what else would he would he leak and what would he have to say? And he had that anonymous Dropbox, which he had developed where he could receive data from anyone anywhere and protect his sources, which made him extremely dangerous, you know, very dangerous. And, you know, during these COVID times, what would he, what would he be leaking? Um, you know, it's just an unknown quantity that had to be stopped as far as authorities were concerned, and they just needed to find a mechanism to do it. So this dubious um, me mechanic that they're using to try and sort of criminalise a, a journalist, you know, that's why it's inflamed everyone worldwide, because it just makes no legal sense, really, ultimately, because it's clear he was just, you know, expressing his right to publish, but it's been dressed up now as some sort of criminal act, and it's very hard to to prove. And um, the main the main point is, and I think this must be worrying for him and his family, is what will happen if he does get extradited and gets onto American soil? Can he be given a fair trial? Will he even get to trial? You know, anything could happen. I, I can't imagine where in the United States he would be given a fair trial. Um, <laughs> this is... <laughs> this is someone who exposed the horrors and lies of wars that were labeled Republican wars in the United States and mm. who exposed the cheating and scheming and unfair political primary elections of the Democratic Party in the United States. Uh, most people in the United States uh, <laughs> identify <laughs> with one or the other of those. Well, and somebody, not, <laughs> yeah, I mean, strictly speaking, the, the, the biggest group is independence of either of those two parties. But uh, in the media, 100 percent of everybody identifies with one or the other of those two parties. 
where is he going to get a fair trial? It, it's so biased, and no one could say that they're not party to what's happened. And it, it's not going to be a fair trial, no. And I don't think the government ultimately wants them on American soil for a fair trial, which means his life's at risk. You know, you have a situation where I'm not, not trying to be doom and gloom, but you know, you have a situation where with high-profile figures like Epstein um, suddenly die in prison, and you know, it would be very convenient for that type of thing to happen. I'm not saying it would, but you know, he's safer on on non-American soil from that perspective. That's for sure. The United States has to promise no death penalty when extraditing from a slightly more civilized country to the United States, right? Well, absolutely, and and, and then human rights are to the fore. But the, the main problem will be, you know, there's been a lot of foreshadowing going on in the court cases, saying that Julian Assange is so mentally ill um, that they consider him a suicide risk, and the first the first trial, the reason he wasn't extradited, I know it's dressed up as, you know, the judge saw his freedom of expression, but that wasn't actually the reason the judge gave for not sending him to America the first time around. It was that she considered him a suicide risk. You know, his mental health is really poor. And I just think um, if things don't go his way and he was extradited, you know, there's a strong argument to suggest that people wouldn't disbelieve the idea that, you know, something might have happened to him from a mental health point of view. You know, so you, can't, you can't rule that out that certain tricks can be played and is he that safe on in another country and the current status is that he, there has been a ruling that he can be extradited and then there's been a sort of a take it back part way ruling that he can appeal that ruling right Correct. yeah he can appeal the ruling to the judges at the supreme court so he's got to another stage where he can can yeah but they haven't they haven't said for sure that they're going to agree to even hear it in the Supreme Court, but they're, you know, they're expected to. Meanwhile, the, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Torture has suggested that he has effectively been tortured by this ordeal, right? Well, he's been saying, you know, Nils Meltz has been saying that all along, and I, I organised, um, just before this whole trial started, I organised an event at Frontline Club, and Nils Meltzer attended that, and he was... He was speaking. So was James Goodale, the former um, New York Times, you know, defence counsel, was speaking via um, video link. But Nils was there in person. But he's been consistent all along, saying this is shocking. I mean, he's actually written a book about it all now as well. I'm right. To see it come out as a film at some point. Uh, I, I, w I would if it were Hollywood making it, but uh, maybe somewhere else. Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, it, it, it seems like there's a shortage right now of people doing what WikiLeaks was doing, that WikiLeaks isn't doing it. I, I mean, I'm convinced that there are secret U.S. Uh, documents suggesting that they are well aware Russia is not about to invade Ukraine tomorrow and that we would see those documents if somebody were doing the job of journalism that Julian Assange was doing. Instead, we've just got... Russia's about to invade any minute without without the balancing act tools. I agree with right. you. I have to agree with you. I think WikiLeaks as an organisation got you know you've got to look at where the where the month follow the money and you've got to look at the situation back in 2010. A lot of people would argue that it's become almost like an asset, if you like, to show to show people and silence people, and the whole thing's been taken over, if you like and WikiLeaks is no more. I mean, it's pretending to still function, but it's not really functioning. And and this whole sort of drag it out treatment of Julian Assange, you know, it's like a crucifixion in many ways. You just watch watch him and watch what will happen to you. And like you say, everything's become silent. Who on earth would take a risk now if they did have the information and data and publishing it um, and being tracked and hunted, hunted down and um, this type of thing happened to them? So. You're right. We're not seeing the other side anymore. And, and, and it's... Sorry. And, and if Julian Assange is punished uh, worse than he already has been, uh, I mean, what is going to be the impact on journalism worldwide and on the conduct 
of governments worldwide. I mean, are other governments other than the, the imperial U.S. forces going to think that they have the privilege to go into any other country and extract a journalist or an editor or a publisher and prosecute them back in their own country? Well, where they America, maybe never it does, been. It does set a precedent. You're right. It sets a precedent. And if you can be basically any country can be a bit peeved and they want to bring a case against you and you can be uplifted um, not America doing it, but, you know, Brazil is angry or, or, or China perhaps angry about something that's being said. Um, everything's just getting shut down, but it's kind of parallel with what's happening with the digital citizenship that we're starting to see come into play, you know, the way COVID's been handled and how it's acted as a tool of fear. Um, I even think a lot of the, you know, climate emergency stuff all seems to be fear narratives that seem to be in play designed to to shut things down in many ways. And I think I'm quite frightened by this digital citizenship where everything we say is algorithmically censored. Um, a lot of that sort of stuff's going on. I mean, you see the Joe Rogan podcast and, you know, thank God for Joe Rogan. But <laughs> maybe Joe Rogan's the new WikiLeaks. But um, how much more are we going to be able to? To hear about before the algorithms get to, get us all and we're not not hearing stuff anymore and it's interesting because i one of the assignments i had early on when i started working with julian assange his last ever public speaking gig he did from the ecuadorian embassy and it was filmed and he gave me the video of it and said get this out and and i got it broadcast at the inaugural world ethical data forum in barcelona at the end of 2018 and interestingly, you can see it on the internet if you Google it, but um, Julian Assange, it's quite haunting hearing it back now, but he said, we are the last generation to be free. And I thought, wow, you know, what a prophetic statement. But, you know, all that seems to have come true in the space of three years since he said that on the video. Yeah. You know. And and if this incredible growth of of censorship and redirection of of right. eyeballs on the internet doesn't work, and if extradictions and trials don't work, right. uh, people used to say you were a lunatic if you suggested the United States might try to kill such a person. It seems uh, clear that the CIA had a plot to kill Julian Assange. And it seems conceivable to me that there will be a push in the U.S. media if Assange is never convicted by a U.S. court uh, to to kill such people rather than deal with the, the problems of, of legal trials, which obviously don't achieve justice. Yeah, we've seen, we've seen the situation with, um, with Epstein being conveniently uh, su suicided <laughs> um, and, for, and Assange is obviously there's been a foreshadowing about him being a suicide risk in the first place. So it would it would go with the narrative of something happened to him of his own making. And um, I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist or suggest anything. I'm a bystander now, but um, no one wants any of this to come to court, really. And I think he's a lot safer on British soil um, than, than going to America for that reason. And it's not that if he got to trial, there wouldn't be a fair trial. It's just what would happen prior to that, that is an absolute unknown quantity. And if extradition is ruled out, is he free? Does he still face any British or Swedish charges of anything? Um, from what I, well, he served the, um, the jumping bail and all that's technically served. So, yeah, I mean, unbelievably, yeah, he technically could walk free. And, and start leaking again tomorrow if, if that happened. But um, can you really honestly, after all the theatre of what's gone on, imagine that, where he'd go back to his apartment and jump on the Wi-Fi and, and start off again? You know, if, if he put his hand up and said, look, I promise, you know, it was on an on a idyllic island without any Wi-Fi and promised to behave, um, they'd probably allow him to go free. You know, because if the United Nations is saying he must be free, yet, you know, we're getting a situation where America is not having it and, and neither has Great Britain. We're in a, so, so, international law so, says so, so. he's an, an innocent man now. You know, what are we going through all this for? But can the authorities allow him such an unknown quantity in this day and age to be 
almost like just free reign that just it creates a phenomenal problem but can you picture the great democracy spreader and bringer of the world into the rule of order banishing a journalist like napoleon to an island and can you picture assange going along with that uh, no i no i can't but i'm just i'm thinking of the only solution that where, where it seems to be a win-win he's got his freedom um and the authorities don't feel like tomorrow everything's you know the rug's going to be pulled out from under them so that's why we've seen this sort of snaking through the legal process and delay as long as possible and at the moment it just seems to be quite well orchestrated in one direction um what could save him and you certainly wouldn't get him coming up with any agreement or any pledge to 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 retire from the internet and retire from what he does that's who he is you know he's a man of principles Nothing they've ever published at WikiLeaks has ever been proven to be fake, you know, in this age of fake news, which is everywhere. Now we're just swamped with disinformation. WikiLeaks stand tall. That's why they've won so many journalism awards. Nothing has ever, it might upset a lot of people, it might polarize people, but nothing has ever been proven to be fake. It's just too damn real. Right, right. Nor has it been proven to be Russian propaganda. No, no not at all. There's no Russian propaganda. He's, he's done leaks against Russia as much as he has America. Of course. Stuff. He really is nonpartisan. He's just been subjected to ultimate propaganda and been used by people as well. I mean, people were giving him information which helped with the American election. Okay. Hey, why don't you use WikiLeaks? And then next minute, they don't even know who WikiLeaks is. You know, it's, it's nonsense. He's been completely used. But I think in many ways, he's, he doesn't present this way, but he is very much a vulnerable person. You know, I think he's very much on the spectrum um his psychology is to to just leak that's what he does yes and he, do, he doesn't know he doesn't have any, have any barrier to doing that he'll just go ahead and do it and he can be a little bit mischievous with it he just does it because he wants to do it and he sees it but it's all real it's all true it's just really inconvenient for everybody <laughs> <laughs> well everybody in power abusing well, the it abuse, just yeah, the, pow the powerful i should say yes agreed <laughs> It's, it's, it's very convenient for the rest yeah. of us uh, and very useful. It's nice and to know what's much actually going on. Yeah, but it's quite rare nowadays, isn't it? So, so with just a minute left, Richard Hillgrove, what can people do who want to help? Do we need more public pressure to have him free and free to do what he was doing? Uh, and, and is that achievable? I think there needs to be some different, some power centers come forward. Maybe some of the people that support him in the past. I mean, people like Lady Gaga went in and saw him at Ecuadorian embassy and some really high profile people have all turned their backs on him. And I think some of those, you know, big names could actually say, well, hold on, what is really going on here? And actually sort of put their hands up and actually try and make a difference. And I think everyone's turned their backs and that will, that will change things. And I think he's been kind of occupied a little bit too much by the left, the hard left as well. There seems to be a lot of like, the don't extradite Assange they're all very kind of socialist left wing and they don't really resonate with the mainstream media. So there's not really a powerful voice in the mainstream media whilst that group it seems to be speaking for him. And that's not him anyway, if you see what I mean. I think some people with a sense of um, hum humanity that see what's going on to this person need to come forward. People yeah. with influence and power need to do that, not just fringe groups. Well, maybe we all need to turn from lobbying MPs to lobbying celebrities and see maybe. see where we get. Uh, we've been we've been speaking with Richard Hillgrove. You can find him at numeral six Hillgrove PR. Richard Hillgrove worked for Julian Assange from 2018 to 2020. Richard, thank you very very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Lovely to be here. Thank you, David. Okay, great. I this is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.